Hey there, welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kay van Davani. I'm very excited to have Knut Svanholm, the author of the amazing educational Bitcoin book, Sovereignty Through Mathematics, on my show for the first time. I met him in Riga at the Bitcoin conference um, together with a you know, bunch of other awesome Bitcoiners and uh, Bitcoin maximalists and really cool speakers with great content. Anyway, so I want to really go deep into the rabbit hole with Knut. Uh, his, his book is relatively short, sweet and compact. Uh, you read it pretty fast. I read it like three times because it really goes into the essence of the question, why Bitcoin? He has a, you know, uh, uh, an excellent knowledge, a really uh, a big, you know, comprehension of the bigger picture of uh you know what does it mean sovereignty what is it what what's what are the monetary properties what are the unique properties of bitcoin so anyway i'm really excited to have him on let me know what you think uh send me your questions your feedback your comments i would all, also of course appreciate it. any kind of positive review on apple itunes any any other podcast platform um or any other whatever uh retweet uh comment whatever you think uh whatever you love and uh yeah thank you so much for your support thanks so much for listening and let's go deep into the rabbit hole with knut svanholm here you go thank you and bye welcome to the total connector show my name is kevin davani today my very special guest is knut svanholm the author of mathematics through so sovereignty bitcoin um, I read the it other, three times. The other way around. <laughs> the other way around. Well, <laughs> sovereignty through mathematics. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so Knut, uh, welcome to the show for my for the first time. I we saw each other in Riga. How are you doing? Doing fine. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm doing great. Just uh, the only thing that really, uh, really, uh, really uh, irritates me is the the freezing cold over here in Austria. But uh, I can handle it. You know, been living here most of my life. So. Knut, uh, it was a great book that you've written. It's short, sweet, compact, and it's got you know the essence of uh, for comprehension for any newbie. I can really congratulate you on that. I have a bunch of questions as you can see on my notebook, and uh, to be honest, I don't know where to start, but I'm gonna start somewhere. Thanks so, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, we saw each other in, in Riga. I wish we could have done this also face to face, but maybe, you know, we'll, we'll get to know each other hopefully, uh, next time, maybe during a Bitcoin event somewhere, somewhere in Europe or in the near future. Yeah. Riga was fantastic, by the way. Yeah. yeah the Bitcoin conference really, I mean, great, you know, uh, great speakers and great content and, and, and it's, it, it was yeah. really a blast. Um, Knut, um, so let me let me let me go uh, by priority. What really fascinates me, because uh, you wrote you you know you took a little bit of tangents, uh, sort of a out of the box, which I love about your book. You you talked about you know uh, because I even wrote down the page numbers uh, while while quoting some of your 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 content. Uh, you wrote about you know uh, origins of money in school uh, on page thirteen and fourteen. You wrote about okay. page seventy again on about schools, institutions. You know what what teacher uh, what you know what kids are actually taught. They're being actually distracted, or if they're hyperactive, if there is you know anything such as you know uh, as a disease and HDHD or ADD. I think it's a total bullshit that you know pharmaceutical have come up up in order to pump up the children with Ritalin. So this is what I really love about your book because it's about education. It's about you know letting children also being in their open minded. Uh, creativity in order to, because if if we cannot start with children uh, uh, educating them and leaving them you know this free space of thinking and comprehension you know where where do we want to you know what kind of future do we want to see do you want to talk about this a little bit what you know what the root problems are in our educational system about school when it comes to money <laughs> like let's stick to the core towards core uh, you know content over here um what, what is it that's going, going wrong uh, in our system? A, a lot of things, I think. Uh, uh, schools are politicized, and I guess they've always been in one way or another. It depends on how your uh, viewpoints on uh, nations and seeing the state as a cult and all this stuff. 
um, uh, to what extent you do that. But uh, I think schools are generally good for the kids, but uh, uh, some aspects of, of it is it's, uh, it's really depressingly politicized. Like when I, I took my daughter to school for, for the first time here a couple of months ago, and they said that the first thing that said they had a meeting on the in the the schoolyard there, and they said this year we're going to focus on the climate, uh, like how to attack the climate problem and everything. And if if you're like me, don't believe that uh, politicians could do anything about a climate problem, uh, regardless of whether you think we have one or not. Uh, I don't think that uh, like taxing people and uh, giving the uh, nation states and the European Union more control over their populations is the way to go. Uh, but the kids are sort of brainwashed into that narrative from a very early age. And it's really depressing because I, I think the teachers themselves uh, are, are very blind to this uh, flaw in the system. And that's, uh, schools, the, the profession teacher attracts people that like school, uh, like people who like to go to school uh, uh, have a higher probability of becoming teachers themselves when they grow up. And uh, the more politicized the school is, the, the more politicized the next generation of teachers will be. And I think it's a negative feedback loop there going on somehow. On the other hand, I think it's very good for the kids to like interact socially with each other, and they, they I, I believe, they learn a lot more from from their friends than from their teachers in their respective classes. Great, because you know, um, been talking about this, you know, with a lot of other uh, guests of mine. Like, uh, w w why and why have we never learned anything about money? Like, where does it come from? How is it created? What is scarcity? Uh, you know, what is, what, is, uh, what is value? How is value created? Uh, and, and let alone, you know, about all this, um, you know, brainwashing with Keynesianism. So, and even economists, you know, tell us, what, you know, we, we, we never learned anything about, you know, the principles of, 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 you know, logical, ethical economics, Austrian economics, anything. So no. where do we start? Um, a very good question. I mean, uh, I I start with trying to teach my kids this stuff at home. Like, uh, for instance, the the prices are just historical data and not uh, a fact. Like, if if you have a, a bottle of milk in, in the supermarket and it has a price tag to it, that doesn't mean anything. But that someone that a lot of people. It, uh, bought it for that price earlier on, but it's not the actual price of uh, not really of uh, prices and how we value things are subjective things, right? And uh, kids have to figure this out themselves, unfortunately, Be because I mean, we we Austrian economic thinking uh, people are are rare. Uh, there are not many people that have these libertarian viewpoints, so I, like like. Most people never reflect about these things, uh, uh, except maybe when bidding on a house or a car or like uh, haggling about something. But that that occurs very very seldomly in in Western countries nowadays, I guess. And uh, speaking about schools, I remember when I, when I grew up, I, I I went to Swedish schools maybe and ma mainly and uh, a Scandinavian school when. We lived in Africa for a couple of months and went to Scandinavian school. But I know that the the, the framework the the Swedish uh, school board use was the, was the same uh, framework they used in in DDR, in East old East Germany. So the, it was based on the same ideas, and we we've been through national TV and radio channels. We have for generations been fed one narrative. Uh, up until the the internet started and people started to question things a little more. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, political result of that in Sweden is like 
more of the same and a nationalist party and not not really this freedom think is uh, still very uh, still very uh, uh, still a very small group uh, of people there are some podcasters and youtubers talking about these things and having sort of a libertarian standpoint but it's it's very stale here in that sense great great yeah um so let's let's go to another point um I think um, a lot of people have have a hard time wrapping the man, uh, mind around uh, about this new virtual money uh, and what is hard money. Uh, and you you know you wrote about page on page twenty one electricity you know converted into digital scarcity. So um, I think a lot of people have uh, first of all because it's literal it's only virtual money and and then and then understanding like what is hard or hardest money. Uh, what is scarce money? Uh, how is how is energy, uh, electricity, you know, turned into digital scarcity, and out of that, uh, you know, uh, you can turn it into a value. So, do you want to like go a little bit deeper um, into this um, um, point? Yeah, I think Bitcoin is connected to the second law of thermodynamics in a sense, because what what a miner does effectively is converting electricity into a specific piece of the world's first digital pie, as Keller Rosenbaum put it. Uh, I really like that expression, the world's first dig digital pie, uh, which is a specific part of a specific number. Uh, and that's a Bitcoin, basically. And uh, it's not uh, that it has value assigned to it automatically. What gives it value is that uh, is supply and demand, uh, just like with everything else. And the supply part is limited in this case, absolutely limited. And the demand part is uh, still very subjective. And uh, Bitcoin has a first mover advantage in that sense and a brand name and it's uh, very very portable you can teleport it from one continent to another uh, for a much cheaper price and much more environmentally friendly i might add uh, than if you were to try to beam a gold bar to australia from here <laughs> so uh, that's like the the main thing and i think the people still underestimate the potential of a, an invention like this and uh, yeah, that's that's one part of the book, and a lot of it is about how uh, how the experiment can be it cannot be replicated because scarcity needs to be framed, and uh, if you start having like multiple scarce things, that sort of nullifies the purpose, I think. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I want to tie this in because you wrote a, it's a funny quote I, I I've written down from your book on page thirteen. Uh, you wrote beam like tele like teleporting like beam wealth anonymously to any other brain now with its pseudonymously anonymously but it it will be eventually totally anonymous this is what i see and then on page 32 we wrote code is a language mathematics is a language and money is a linguistic tool a linguistic tool we use as a means of expressing value to each other and as a way to transport value through space and time. And I think this is what is so evolutionary. When we tie this in with like, now it's totally unconfiscatable, uncensorable. Uh, you can transport it through space and time. Uh, you know, it's not like gold, you would need a third party or some kind of high technology, high sophisticated technology to assay the validity, the authenticity of the gold. Um, it is open. It is all of these things that Andreas Antonopoulos has always been preaching about, you know, like open, decentralized, uh, immutable, um, uh, uh, un actually apolitical or non -pol For me, it's actually non-political because politics has no, has no role in this whole thing anymore. There's no, yeah. there's no single point of failure. There's no interventionism. Uh, it's yeah, it is trust, trustless. It's, uh, um, yeah. Um, this is the beauty of the system, and uh, this is why I also in the uh, make the point in the book about uh, politics, which can be viewed as uh, you have the you know you have the right-left scale, 
and the Galtan scale where they have another axis that they conjured up about more or less uh, authoritarian regimes, I think. But in the end, you can view all politics as uh, you have a zero point here and uh, everything to the left of that. Uh, so, um, uh, because basically, as, lo as soon as you uh, imply, a, as soon as you uh, uh, run a policy on a population that not everybody might uh, agree, something that everybody might not agree on, uh, then you have to coerce people somehow into to doing what they're told, and this is this is how it's always been as long as we've had leaders, uh, and uh, we still have leaders. We have democracy, which is uh, I believe is a step uh, in the right direction, maybe, but it's still uh, thinking that. Uh, democracy as a goal in itself and that we can't evolve it from, from that into something else is uh, narrow-minded I think uh, I mean we, we've had hereditary rule in many earlier civilizations like feudal societies and uh, kings and queens and all that and uh, uh, of course the, the, the illusion of people in power is is greater when you have a democracy so i guess it's easier to rule people uh, if they if they think that they have something to say in the game and to a certain extent people do in democracies but i think in order to be self-sovereign and to to really take control of your life because you're basically born into this world and you didn't choose the system you were born in and if you want to reclaim that you you there are different ways of doing that. You can stop watching TV, stop reading news, and you can use Bitcoin, like which is the ultimate expression of self-sovereignty, I think, in a sense. Yeah, and I think this is the problem with um, a lot with our society or civilization. It's uh, people, first of all, people like here in Austria, or in Western developed countries, um, People are still, you know, have a still have a, you know, comfortable life. They're too too comfortable, too complacent. Maybe um, they they don't care. Why should they care? Sometimes I'm thinking, you know. But uh, it, I think it takes a lot of, um, uh, you know, also courage and 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 uh, self responsibility. Um, it, you know, to 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 become to have the aspiration, the desire to become self sovereign, and with that comes actually, if you think it through, comes a lot of, um, you know, uh, other aspects of our lives and our society, which can be freed up. And I think this is something people have a hard time imagining even what yep. kind of ci civilization we could have on the monetary root laying of Bitcoin. Because I see way, so, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I know I'm repeating myself uh, uh, in a lot of my interviews, but I see something way beyond, uh, you know, monetary economical uh, uh, sort of uh, system yeah. that we're creating. This is a totally new evolutionary uh, uh, process that we are triggering with Bitcoin because it's about, you know, the control obsessive centralized structures that we are freeing up. And I think uh, this is, it's hard for a lot of people imagining or comprehending what this means actually, you know. Yeah, and it is scary because it means more responsibility, taking more responsibility for your own actions, ultimately, and uh, for your own security and for your own uh, decisions in general. I mean, uh, but the the internet keeps on disrupting industry after industry, like we could see with and uh, the centralized uh, things they keep fighting back, like the uh, the old media channels are fighting. YouTube and Twitter and so on, uh, best they can, and uh, uh, the hotel lobby, pun intended, uh, are uh, fighting Airbnb. The taxi cartels are fighting uh, in the different cities are fighting Uber, Uber and uh, everything else. Uh, and like Bitcoin is the ultimate cutting out the middleman tool. I mean, you can't really cut more middlemen than that cutting all the middlemen and like going yeah. back to basics it's basically barter but with the perfect tool or almost perfect tool exactly. uh, and th yes. this is as good as it gets we, we have one shot at this and uh, 
the experiment can't be repeated. Uh, I believe this is right. this is what I believe to the, be the biggest, the most dangerous attack vector on this is like some other cryptocurrency or some other blockchain yeah. technology or whatever bullshit they conjure up. It's taking over this because they had more marketing or whatever, and we miss the opportunity to embrace something that grew organically out of the internet itself and out of people. Uh, we shouldn't miss this. We should, yeah. we should study it and we should treasure it because it's a beautiful beast and it should not be tamed. It should be set free. <laughs> yes, excellent. <laughs> and as you wrote in your book, you said Pandora's box of an ID uh, sort of is open up and cannot be changed again or cannot be closed again by anyone. And I love that. Um, so yeah, the cat is out of the bag, I would say. Uh, yeah. And um, understanding, uh, you know, and, and really cleaning up with all this brainwashed indoctrination of, you know, whatever money is a, is a social construct, a social illusion. I don't know what, what kind of people, you know, what kind of expressions people even in universities come up with. But finally, we understand that Bitcoin has monetary properties, which we could have never dreamt of. All right. And yeah. uh, this is this is the, the potential to see w what kind of civilization we can have on this you know on this healthy new soil and foundation. Is, yeah, yeah. It, I think it's unimaginable for most people. And, yeah. and this is what what I see. You see, you know, we, once we have this critical adoption rate, the mass adoption is going to take care of itself. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to be weird, much weirder than MP3. So the fax machine disappearing. This is a this is a, a new, totally different beast. And like, uh, uh, just to be clear on one point, there uh, there might be attack vectors that you and I and everyone else in the community haven't thought haven't thought of yet. So the experiment might still fail. But my book is like written from the viewpoint that uh, like if this works, it, it it implies that this and this and this will happen. And this is what it'll, it will do to society uh, as a whole. And I, I'm trying to uh, be in that mindset as much as possible because I think this is, like I said, the one shot we have at this. And uh, the more uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to use the word believers because I think this is a system of unbelief in a sense. No, I think uh, it's about trust uh, because it's about trust. For me, it's it's the word trust because trust in yeah. every relationship, every That's interaction and That's trust means comprehension for me. It's knowledge. Believing yeah. is like wishing, hoping, like, you know, something super superstitious. I don't know. It, it, uh, but, but yeah, it makes sense. You know what you're it's, saying? Yeah. Totally. It's about verification ultimately. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't trust verify as the slogan goes and don't believe verify. I would, I would have put it, i put it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, where were we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's go to another point. Um, uh, by the way, I love the the analogy. I don't know the comparison with the because uh, I was thinking, you know, of, like uh, how do ants work? Like you talked about on page thirty three about the ther uh, termite uh, colonies. Like uh, they have complex structures emerge from simple rules. Yeah, isn't that it? We need simple rules, and this yeah, is the... what the simple essential rules we have in Bitcoin. You know, yeah. this fascinates me a lot, uh, and like the the ways we try to explain things that are really simple uh, uh, but but become complex how how complex system emer systems emerge out of simple rules is something that i think the human brain has a hard time comprehending sometimes like when you see a a, a tree or like a flower or anything in nature really that or uh, that has a uh, uh, it looks like a designed patent but it's really uh, things branching off uh, according to a fractal pattern with it, which is really a basic mathematical thing and like uh, the spiral of a, a uh, yeah the, yeah the I love your thinking I love the way you shape. think from the mathematical or sacred geometry viewpoint um, and out of that simplicity comes this beauty of complexity sort of as I would call it yeah 
yeah exactly and uh, how how things in, can emerge uh, uh, rather than be designed uh, and I think th this is this is why I think the uh, one of the main points uh, about this is uh, and it, why why the experiment cannot be replicated and why altcoins are bullshit because Bitcoin uh, in a way was designed by Satoshi wrote the white paper and everything but after that and for 10 years now it's been growing by itself organically it's open source and it's a community it's a network it's a protocol it's all of these things that really couldn't have happened any other way and this is how it needs to grow and evolve the uh, it's it's not something we can do anything about. We should study it, as I as I say in the book as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, um, let's talk about um, volatility because uh, you know this is sort of a, like the the first argument people bring us. Oh, Bitcoin is volatile, and you know I agree with you. Like you said on page forty, you said volatility is needed. Not only, I think, in my opinion, for price discovery, but volatility, as you write, is needed in order for these hyper cycles or hype cycles to happen uh, in order to become, you know, hyper Bitcoin uh, un until it leads to hyper Bitcoinization. You want to like elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I think this is one of the most speculative sections of the book. Actually, I don't really know if if uh, this was designed or not, like the four year. Hype, uh, four year halving hype cycles in between thing that seems to be occurring on a regular basis. I mean, for those who don't know, Bitcoin uh, halves uh, the, the Bitcoin block subsidy, which is the, the reward part of the, uh, the subsidy is the, uh, uh, the part of uh, the block reward that is uh, new, newly minted Bitcoin and not fees from other transactions. Uh, and uh, this halves every four years. Uh, and uh, it seems like the price has a peak in between halvings. Uh, the Bitcoin tends to have a bull run uh, somewhere in the, between the two halvings, like 2017 and uh, 2014 before that and 2011 before that I believe mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I speculate in the book that uh, Satoshi wrote this the protocol this way on purpose and not as a smooth distribution curve uh, in, in order to uh, to to get these hype cycles as a an onboarding ramp but I can't be sure about this this is highly speculative and uh, but I think it's a fascinating thought and it would take a multifaceted genius such as him to to uh, come up with an idea like that because it's not uh, there's nothing natural about having uh, havings every four years uh, so yeah we'll see what happens there's a halving coming up uh, like six months from now right so uh, we'll see yeah. what happens then yeah yeah, I mean, if you like, if you zoom a little bit out, and you know, we take in uh, the, uh, also the of the Plan B's uh, stock to flow ratio, the halvings, the the hype cycles. This this reoccurring, as you say in page thirty nine, you say the reoccurring hype cycles. You know, uh, you talk about the halvings, the bull markets, the weeding out of the altcoins or shitcoins, and the on mm. onboarding mechanism. Sort of, it, it also yeah. serves as an onboard mechanism. It's actually sort of as a gift, as I see it, or as an opportunity, like a granting opportunity to newbies who want to come in. But then, instead of like uh, you know onboarding them at the highest price, they have uh, in those like. Uh, in those um, in those phases, in those intermittent phases, they have the opportunity to buy it at a lower price in fiat terms, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And they never do. <laughs> <laughs> they never do. Yeah. Or actually, they get into FOMO when it's twenty thousand, as we've seen like uh, yeah, so many yeah. times. So yeah, that's a uh, mass psychology, I guess. So, yeah, but look look at it now. I think like a lot of people went in around like between seven and thirteen thousand, and we're at the low end of that spectrum spectrum right now but that doesn't mean it was a bad investment just wait two years and see what happens right 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 yeah. right right so 
you talk, uh, I love the way you describe, you know, about uh, the, the connection between scarcity, time, space, value, and the unforgeable costliness. That's why it's hard money. If you need electricity, you need energy, you, it, needs to, it needs work, it needs the proof of work, the proof of energy, unforgeable co costliness. Uh, yeah, and, the, and you talk also about the validation of Bitcoin blocks uh, by a, a full load compared to gold, which is like totally like un, uh, not practical at all. Yeah. Uh, and first of all, it's uh, confiscatable. Gold is confiscatable. And how do you assay the validity, authenticity of gold? Uh, you know, you have to rely, you know, third party or high tech or, or I don't know, or uh, any other methods. Um yeah. Um, you want to comment a little bit on that? Yeah, I think I used the term validation in the book a bit too frivolously because I, I think uh, validation has a, is a technical term also for Bitcoin. But what I mean is like uh, by validation is like you can you can look at the hash of a Bitcoin block and you can validate for yourself that the proof of work was was put in there somehow by just looking at the zeros. Because very many zeros in front of a hash equals a lot of work. Uh, and, uh, but you can't, by doing that, you, you validate uh, the, uh, that the work was done, but you don't really validate that the Bitcoin is uh, uh, real. Like mm -hmm. uh, 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 a Bitcoin cash block could also have a lot of zeros in front of it. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean that it's a, a, a thing that will be absolutely scarce and stay valuable for a long t period of time. But you can verify that the, the, the work was actually put in there. Uh, and, and within the context of that social consensus of Bitcoin, like, yeah, right? The, co the consensus rules is the uh, least talked about ta part about the, mm -hmm. uh, the Bitcoin protocol. And I think it's one of the if not the most important part about it. Like we need to agree uh, on what this thing is in order for it to work. Otherwise we'll just have forks all the time and things splitting off like a train robbery. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, another point I wrote down is um, uh, on page 67, you wrote about the quantitative easing like whatever it is, like printing uh, money out what of the page? air. Uh, page 67, you wrote about quantitative easing. I mean, there's all kinds of euphemism of uh, quantitative easing, whether it's printing money out of yeah. thin air or, yeah. cr or creating digital. Now it's actually creating debt out of nothing, out of thin air, um, 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 uh, which we know now that 90% of all, you know, the, 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 you know maybe 10% is, is printed like paper money. The rest is all digital, centralized digital yeah. money. So this is what people, I think, need to understand. So quantitative easing is counterfeiting. So if, if we did that, we would uh, immediately go to to jail. So because it's any counterfeiting is theft. So what what we are what we are actually um, um, seeing and witnessing and, and experiencing is constantly we're being our money is devalued, debased, and uh, we're being stolen from. And I think this is a very you know, simple principle that that uh, we all need to understand. You know, so it's theft. Whatever. Yeah. You know, it's a crime. And so. people are so ignorant to this. Uh, it's really mind-boggling because uh, there was a meme going around in Sweden about the when the uh, gas prices went up a lot here uh, uh, the the other year. Uh, there was a meme going around like this. This is a sandwich ice cream. Uh, in 1971, and it was one krona, and this is one liter of gasoline uh, in 1971, and it was one krona. And look at it now, like the the uh, sandwich ice cream is 17 kronas, and the uh, uh, liter of gasoline is 16 kronas. Ha ha! The prices uh, of the ice cream has gone up even further, and blah 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 blah. And no one noticed that someone took 16 17. Uh, uh, like <laughs> took 95% of everybody's money du during those years. Like the wealth of the nation has been drained of like 95%. And and people focus on ice cream and gasoline. And it's, it's ridiculous. 
like what happened to to the value we were supposed to store in your paper yeah uh, <laughs> no, right. no one seems to ask these questions they just right. take it for granted that yeah. inflation is some natural phenomenon that yeah. happens yeah and uh this is the brainwashing I'm talking about, you know, I mean, I'm not even expecting, you know, uh, ever because I had to really go deep down the rabbit hole and see and understand for myself uh, where does this, you know, centrally obsessive uh, system come from. It comes from the very core of the central banking structure, uh, which are, you know, doing all these things uh, without any kind of, 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 of uh, you know, penalty, or or they are literally above the law. I think pe most people don't even know that the members of the Bank for International Settlements, who are who have the agents, the technocrats within the Bank for International Settlements, and which which is privately owned by all the shareholders of the other central banks, yeah. are doing. You know, this is this is where it go, this is where it leads to. But I think understanding the 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 root causes. Uh, and that they are actually above the law and they have literally a legal immunity. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, a lot of people un know that or understand that or wish to know, you know? No, no, you're, uh, uh, most of us are happy to uh, take the blue pill and stay in the matrix forever. Yeah, yeah, it's comfortable, like, yeah. yeah. Steak is good, it's getting <laughs> pricey, but it's still good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, at least it, everything it else be. tastes like chicken because it's hard to program taste into stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the taste made matrix, um, exactly. Uh, so you also wrote uh, what I love uh, is you wrote on page seventy six: Bitcoin is a voluntary system, and democracy is not. And I think it's yeah. really important we talk about you know what is democracy really. Yeah, and this is like. This is scary stuff because if you sell your Bitcoin and your tax authority jumps on you and says, like, attacks you and says, like, you've made a profit here, you need to pay your taxes, that's, that's coercion and that's something they enforce upon you through, through the different systems that they've come up with during the years. But it's all based on the, the notion of a net nation and the notion of a nation comes from uh, one group of our forefathers being really nasty to another group of our forefathers and taking stuff from them and claiming the, themselves kings and lords and stuff all over the land and then that turned into a democracy somehow but uh, the, there was still an elite and as long as as long as money production and uh, money issuance is centralized we won't be free. We're, this is the only way to truly emancipate ourselves and rid ourselves of our clutches. Exactly. Poetic. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I have empathy, really. I have empathy with my fellow, you know, human citizens. Uh, it's it's not easy. I mean, going down the rabbit hole at least once, I think, is a prerequisite yeah. to understanding Bitcoin. Yeah, the thing about going down the rabbit hole is that pretty soon you will be bitten by a honey badger who lives there. It's not a, <laughs> a rabbit hole at all. It's a honey badger's den. <laughs> and that is scary to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's scary. Yeah, yeah. I can totally uh, understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and the thing is, like, for you and me and for people in, in uh, like, relatively civilized uh, countries, like, we don't really have a... A problem going uh, like date in our day-to-day -day lives I mean we can we can definitely survive and we can even thrive in the societies we have but like for for, for the people of Venezuela or Argentina uh, this that's a different story and hyperinflation could could happen anywhere you don't know and like I'm pretty scared about uh, our national currency we never we never uh, converted to the euro here so we have our swedish krona which is right. more and more of a shit currency it's uh, like going down compared to everything else so and we're a small country so they're like in the wrong hands uh, a lot of things can go wrong really quickly yeah 
Uh, well, as I said, people are too comfortable, too complacent, too, I don't know, or uh, they just, you know, don't care or are ignorant. I was just talking to Ben Perrin of BTC Sessions. Great guy, you know, great educator. Yeah, I met him in Riga. Yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, I really was, great know, guy. Yeah, Super guy. And, and I told him, you know, I mean, we're talking about European Union. I'm talking about over here, you know, like uh, German banks now, now putting a negative interest rate on first retail accounts, savings or deposit accounts. Uh, now Greece uh, obliging people to to spend at least thirty percent or one third of you know of their transaction via electronic payments in Italy by next year there's a maximum uh, cash transaction of three thousand and then I think twenty twenty two it's reduced to one thousand euros I mean this is yeah, crazy yeah. It, it does, so they're they're and, really preparing the road. Yeah. For, for eliminating cash. Yeah, I, I heard your other podcast there uh, uh, about when you talked about the negative interest rates there and everything. Really interesting stuff and really scary stuff. Like over here, I have my banking app and uh, I had to fill out the you know, KYC form about what is this account for and uh, where is the money coming from, where is the money going to, uh, in order to keep the app on the phone. They would turn it down. It says like you have to fill this in before we turn it off, and you have these statistics like you spent your money on this, you spent your money on this. Really, or Orwell would turn in his grave about this stuff because the, it's what it is. It's 1984. Uh, it's in the, some ways really b b worse than that. Actually, yeah, it's really, <laughs> really bad. Uh, I mean, what are people uh, waiting for? Like for the social joke. credit system of in China, like in China? This is what we're facing, you know, with yeah, Lagarde now, the European Central Bank. She's just a puppet. But, I mean, come on. I mean, this is uh, people, I don't know, you know, what, what does it need to have a pain point, you know, to, to have an inspiration to say, you know, I'm doing this at least for myself and my beloved ones. This is what I do, just don't get, you know. Unfortunately, I, I think it takes a lot and I think it's, uh, it's hard to tell, but it certainly looks like it will be too late before people wake up to these things. Like people will all, all have already uh, will have already accepted the dr draconian like face recognition bullshit and uh, like uh, when you uh, when you get a visa for for the U.S. you need the fingerprints on both your hands now, so so they have. They have that on you, and like, uh, it's it's ridiculous. Well, China's the worst, of course, and what's happening in Hong Kong right now is really depressing and really scary. Yeah. Uh, and uh, people, like, in every uh, every place that stuff like that happened, uh, people always think that it, it can't happen here and it won't happen to them. And then it does, and then it's too late. And like, like it's the same thing with hyperinflation. Like, like I, the point I make in the book is like, and I wrote an article about the, an earlier article about this called "We're All Venezuelans" uh, <laughs> in a sense, because uh, the hyperinflation uh, is happening everywhere uh, at different, just at different speeds. Uh, it's the same thing everywhere. Like inflation is happening, and then it. It's, more and more inflation happens. If you have a 2% inflation every year, that's actually a, an exponential thing in the long run. And yeah. uh, uh, so it's bound to happen everywhere. And it happened to every fiat, uh, historical fiat currency we ever had. Look at a pound sterling. It's called a pound sterling because it was worth one pound of silver at one point in time. Right, exactly. And, and that dollar, I looked this up the other day, uh, while writing what what could be the sequel to my book, I don't know yet, but we're writing something. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, a gold bar, uh, an ounce of gold in uh, 1971 was redeemable for $35. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like $1,464 now, something like mm -hmm. that, $1,500. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ridiculous. And <laughs> someone made all that profit. Someone took all that money. <laughs> and that's not, uh, I mean, uh, e even back then in 1971, uh, even though gold, uh, the, the dollar was redeemable for gold, 
they had still started their money printing already right and to to like finance the whole uh the whole uh vietnam war and everything and nixon's political campaigns and uh, all of this stuff uh so they had inflation out of control in america because there were too many dollar bills in circulations uh, in circulation and when when foreign uh bankers tried to redeem their gold uh they they just stopped and said like no you can't redeem it anymore you can't you, you can't buy gold for your money you you need to accept our paper dollars like <laughs> we promise to give it back to you someday <laughs> and then they bought the world for paper it's everyone fell for it or like <laughs> it's the cantillion effect as well like uh, when the the people closest to the elite and to the to the real top circle there they're the ones that that benefit from all this first so like the closer you are to the source of the inflation the more you stand to gain from the inflation and this is a scary part about it because that means that the more powerful you are the more incentivized you are to be pro inflation and pro keynesian exactly theory. yeah and the, yeah. this is this is the real death trap and the, this is the the real uh, core of the problem, I believe. Like all the people in power are incentivized to to act in ways which keep them in power, and all the power structures are built in such ways that the most vicious people end up on top, and the the, the ones that are most likely to rip everyone else off in the most cunning ways. Right. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, sad stuff. It's it's way beyond, I think, imagination for most people. How how manipulated, how corrupt, and how criminal the the foundation of our very lives uh, that we are being directed to, you know, and 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 uh, steered into uh, is. I mean, it's 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 way beyond description. Um, and but we got to start somewhere. And I and and I think, yeah. Uh, it needs, uh, as um, as Hayek said, or who was it who said, you know, it doesn't come out of a human design, but human action. So what we need really, yeah. it's, 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 it's Mises, right? So yeah. what we really need is uh, this, this, this weird word of prexology, the, the study of human behavior. We need yeah. this into action. We need this translated and converted and transmuted and transformed into action. People need to, yeah. you know, on all kinds of levels, mentally, intellectually, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and really go into action and get, get a skin in the game, buy a few yeah, satoshis yeah. And, and educate themselves and do it at least for themselves and their beloved ones, the family, and, uh, and, and really start understanding what does it mean uh, once we have a freed, a free money that, uh, that, is, that is totally decentralized. Yeah. This is the hard part for most people, I think. Yeah, I think so too. It's such it's such a giant leap. Uh, uh, but it's a beautiful vision, problem. you know. It's it a is, beautiful it reality. Uh, human action by Ludwig von Mises, by the way, is one of the uh, abs the best books I've read in my life. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, if you read that and the Emperor's New Clothes by H.C. Uh, 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 Anderson and mm -hmm. uh, 1984 by George Orwell, you know how the word world works after that <laughs> please <laughs> you, you have a a, a very th those three books are very good tools for piercing the veil so to speak and exactly. yeah. uh, uh, bitcoin is by is about drawing your own door and escaping through it uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, the things we're discussing now is to an outsider this might sound like very tinfoil hatty and conspiratory yeah. and everything. Yeah. And uh, we, you and I can't really say which, uh, what extent uh, s stuff is happening, what, to what extent it is affecting people. But at least we, we see what's going on and we see that there's an alternative. And we're, we're willing to, to stand on that barricade and fight for it fight for a right to party <laughs> yeah and yeah. we don't even you know the beauty of this thing is we don't even need to waste uh 
uh, too much energy, like on fighting or protesting, you know, or revolting. No. We just need, who said that, Buck Buckminster Fuller or something? Like, we just need to create a new structures, paraphrasing here somehow, uh, in order to, you know, make the old ones obsolete. And this is what we're doing. We're creating new structures, new, pl new foundations, new yeah. roots. Weapon of mass discussion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, really enjoyed this talk. Um, yeah, me Knut, too. Um, thank you so much for your time, Knut. Uh, do you have any like? Uh, do you have any final thoughts? Like, what are the? Wh where do you see from here? What are the challenges or or paths we're going? Uh, do you see some things emerging right now which people do not, you know, cannot cannot uh, whatever perceive it yet? Uh the lightning network ought to be a much bigger thing and uh, ought to make uh, much bigger headlines across the world, I think. Uh, like that's, uh, that's the dream Bitcoin uh, happening there. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't go to the conference in Berlin this year, but. Uh, oh, I was there. It was really yeah, good. It was really yeah, yeah, beautiful imagine, speakers. Yeah. 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 And I like everything that's happening there. And, uh, Um, yeah, it's always hard to predict the future, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I I hope I hope we'll uh, have another bull run soon because it's there's so much fun in those uh, when the mainstream try to comprehend and try to try to <laughs> get get up to speed with everything. I mean. It, even if you're a hardcore nerd and you do this every day, it's hard to keep up with everything. It's really yeah. hard. And I don't, by the way, I have a day job, uh, quite mm -hmm. time consuming day job as well. And uh, having a family and a house and such is time consuming as well. Uh, but I mean, even things are moving so fast and uh, it's just ridiculous. And uh, we have a, like being as cynical as we are about about these systems that we live in, we still live in really exciting times, the most exciting times at the same time, right? Because totally. yeah. uh, the beautiful things that could emerge and like a weapon of mass discussion is what we need to have the most peaceful revolution ever and the most beautiful transfer of wealth and transfer of power we could imagine. I mean, there's really uh, nothing negative to say about it, really. About yeah. Bitcoin, that is. Yeah, beautiful final thoughts. Anyway, you, you've done really a precious, intense, indispensable work, educational work with this book. Thank Bitcoin, you so much. Bitcoin, mathematics, uh, uh, through sovereignty, through mathematics. I can really yeah. recommend any of my listeners and viewers to read this book. You can read it like it's so. I mean, I, I read it like three times, like because I had to oh, read wow. it because, it, yeah, because <laughs> it was it's 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 a very simple language, but it but it really goes to the core of of all these facets, you know, that make up Bitcoin, you know, Thank like the, you. the the question of why Bitcoin. So this is I think for any for any newbie, for any noob, even for any advanced Bitcoiner, this is something that reminds you of you know why are we in this in this space, you know, after all, <laughs> why are we doing this? You know, the question of understanding words, the, uh, really. definitely. And uh, might I add, uh, if we're sealing the book here, uh, it's also available in, uh, it's available in, in English, of course, and now also in German and Finnish. Wow, congratulations, finally. The yeah. Finnish version is finally finished. Yeah, and, so uh, there's no excuse, even for the no. German-speaking people. <laughs> they got to no. read this. <laughs> and uh, there's a Russian version coming up, a Spanish version coming up, a Polish version coming up. Wow. Just got a, a, a message from a guy today who wants to translate it into Polish. Looking forward to that. And an Italian version coming up as well. Uh, wow, that's excellent. Excellent. And uh, that you can listen to the entire thing uh, for free there. And uh, you have the page right there. Uh, on uh, anchor.fm the crypto economy yeah yeah guy swan is reading it and mm -hmm. uh, we're we're turning that into an audiobook as well i think his reading of it uh i really really enjoyed listening to it myself because he talks about it and he comments on it and 
uh, like there's half an hour of the book and half an hour of his commentary track there and which is really excellent he's like elaborates a bit further and all the things there so yeah there i am <laughs> there you are your handle twitter <laughs> handle is uh, Knut Svanholm. So I'm going to put this all in the show notes anyway. And no. uh, thank you again, Knut. It was really enjoyed our talk. And I hope we can repeat this. Uh, with a, hopefully yeah, and a hope to see you life. again at the conference. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, in the not too far future. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So have a have a good time in Spain. Uh, and Knut, I'll see you soon again. All right. Thank you. Appreciate Kieran. that. Bye bye. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye bye. So, hey, so what do you guys think about this awesome interview with Knut Svalholm, the author of the fantastic book, Bitcoin, Sovereignty Through Mathematics? You should definitely read it. It's short, sweet. And so as you have you seen, have you heard, um, Knut is like really, uh, you know, ran really deep into the rabbit hole. He knows what's, what's at stake here. This is, this is uh, the one shot we have to really gain back our, our total freedom, our true freedom on every level imaginable, whether it be on a social level, monetary, economical level, spiritual, scientific, technological level. Um, and yeah, and you know, get back our true sovereignty, our true freedom when it comes uh, you know, to the root cause of all this uh, you know, suffering, pain, uh, symptoms uh, globally around the world. And that is money. As a store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account, as a, you know, uh, you can transport it, we can, uh, you know, send it through time and space. So we need to, you know, uh, solve this um, by the roots. Um, and yeah, let me know what you think. Please give me your feedback, uh, your questions for next time. I would also appreciate a positive review on any podcast platform. And thank you again so much for your support, for listening and for retweeting and for um and if you like it please subscribe follow share whatever you do thanks so much again bye